Our next speaker again would be addressing the problems in central nervous system. He would be talking to us on dementia syndromes, clinical evaluation and management. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Manjula Kaldera, consultant neurologist, teaching hospital Anuradhapura. Over to you, Manjula. Uh, thank, uh, you thank you very, very much, much ma'am. Ma uh, uh, hope uh, you all hear me. Uh, if anyone want to uh, have the slides, you can drop me an email. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, President and the President-elect, give me the opportunity. And uh, congratulate you having such a wonderful participation in these difficult times. So my talk is uh, Dementia Syndromes, uh, Clinical Evaluation and, and, and Management. is a little bit of a sort of a task uh, for the generalist, but I'll try to sort of make it more simplifier simplify uh, for a general doctor. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, like any uh, syndrome, dementia is also a collection of symptoms and signs. And the most commonly uh, presenting uh, symptom uh, is memory complaints. But all the people that we encounter with memory complaints are actually not having, uh, not having uh, dementia. Uh, most of them uh, do actually uh, uh, have uh, uh, do actually have uh, uh, no cognitive complaints. Uh, so most of them are worried well. Um, they uh, are having anxiety problems. Uh, they usually come and uh, complain to doctor, I have forgetfulness, but then you elaborate, uh, uh, get a good narrative. Uh, what they uh, refer as uh, their cognitive complaints, actually they are having uh, deficits in their attention that they forget something to get from their uh, shopping list uh, kind of thing. Uh, and people uh, who can have these complaints with uh, uh, depression as well. So it's very important to look for the symptoms and signs of uh, depression if they have any, uh, then it's worth treating them. And sometimes people can have functional or historical uh, complaints of cognitive impairment where when you converse with these patients, you obvious that they don't have a cognitive impairment, but when you perform a cognitive battery, you get unrealistic, uh, deranged cognitive results, which is uh, due to their functional uh, functionality of the problem, which is hysterical. Um, when you encounter cognitive problems, sometimes these cognitive problems can be very mild, uh, uh, mild decline of their cognitive functions, which usually doesn't affect their activities of daily living. Those conditions are called mild cognitive impairment, it usually doesn't help with treatment. Uh, you usually don't treat them uh, because there's no benefit has been shown treating mild cognitive impairment. But when you have uh, cognitive function derangement, which affects the activities of daily living, that is called dementia. Now, dementia is an umbrella term. You can get dementia due to various other conditions, uh, neurodegenerative conditions, neuroinfections, metabolic, structural, toxic uh, encephalopathies, uh, can give rise to memory complaints or memory cognitive deficits. But uh, today's our talk uh, will be based on neurodegenerative dementias, where you get uh, deterioration uh, of their uh, uh, or progression of their syndrome without any reversing. Now, neurodegenerative dementias are basically proteinopathies. When your proteins functioning normally, they have a normal uh, architecture. But when these abnormal, when these proteins uh, folded in an abnormal fashion or a misfolded protein, they become very uh, clumpy, sticky, and they used to aggregate. And these aggregations takes place in the brain cells and which would promote neurodegeneration. So we are going to discuss these neurodegenerative conditions uh, in this talk. Now, the abnormal proteins uh, are uh, varying uh, uh, according to the dementia syndrome. Most of you are aware about Alzheimer's disease, which is uh, the abnormal protein is uh, amyloid and tau. In frontotemporal dementias, uh, a significant number of uh, uh, cases associated with tau proteins and the TDP43, and there's uh, about 10% associated with the first protein. And in Levy body dementias, uh, you'll get uh, Sinclair pathology. Now, uh, of course, these uh, proteins are helpful uh, when you have challenging case to find uh, the diagnosis uh, uh, verified, but uh, they are not available to most of us. 
Now, it is very much important uh, to solve the puzzle. Um, so, uh, sorting out a dementia syndrome is something like a jigsaw puzzle, where you need to uh, uh, where you need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, what is the most likely clinical syndrome. So, the uh, uh, things like attention, uh, 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 the, the, the domains of the cognition uh, are the important things uh, to sort out the syndrome. So, uh, uh, what are the important domains that uh, you need to concentrate on? Attention and orientation. Commonly seen attention problems in the anxiety, ang anxious people, worried people are likely to have attention problems. And the orientation problems are commonly seen in people have delirium. Uh, then the memory uh, is commonly seen in Alzheimer's disease. The language, where your speaking lam language, the reading, writing language could be affected in uh, semantic dementia and primary progressive aphasia, and then the logopenic variant of the uh, primary progressive aphasia. And then the executive and frontal lobe functions are commonly affected in the frontotemporal dementia. Apraxias are commonly seen in corticobasal syndrome. Visual spatial liability, uh, where you check uh, the the copy drawing, uh, uh, the, your visual functions being tested can be affected in uh, conditions like uh, posterior cortical atrophy and the body dementia. Now we'll go to the case scenarios. Case one, uh, a 67 year old uh, retired policeman was brought in by his wife uh, and wife reports that the husband is forgetful. Um, in your, when you're taking a detailed history, you will encounter that this man has failed to keep the important appointments uh, and he is extremely poor in taking messages pa and passing them to the family members when the family members are not at home. And uh, he is used to ask uh, the, the same questions again and again, repeated questioning. And uh, he has once lost the route when he returned from home, uh, returned home uh, from the shop and his neighbors have helped them to find the way back to his home. Um, initially, the man, uh, the policeman, was the one who sort of uh, the leading figure in the home, who used to sort of settle the uh, the utility bills, arranging home financial things, buying things from the shop. But now the wife has to take over the uh, the leadership in the uh, the household chaos. And um, uh, when you encounter his uh, remote memory, uh, is relatively much preserved than the recent memory. Um, when you ask about the school days, the first job, you would be able to give some good account uh, to the things related to the past memory. When you do a mini mental uh, uh, exam, uh, he scored very poorly uh, in the recall, which is uh, uh, si significant for the episodic memory, and the copy drawing uh, that you can see, uh, the intersecting pentagon was not properly drawn uh, as it is shown in this slide. So what do you think? This patient is likely to have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's uh, uh, dementia um, uh, is a, uh, typically present uh, in the old age after 65. And the predominant uh, cognitive uh, derangement is seen in the memory domain. So it is being considered as an amnestic syndrome. In that episodic memory, which is the part that we are going to test by the recall, there's a gradient memory impairment has been demonstrated where the anterograde memory, which is a newly encountered memory, is uh, more deficient than the retrograde memory, the past event memory. And these patients are typically having uh, the thing called head turn sign, where you uh, ask a patient uh, about something very relevant. You expect to know the answer, something like, how did you uh, come uh, to the clinic today, something like that. Uh, these people either give a wrong answer or give the correct answer and perhaps turn to the spouse or the informant who is a uh, bystander to get a visual cue that the patient has answered correctly or not. And uh, the repetitive questioning was also a, uh, a, a sign that the patient has anterograde memory problems. Uh, and uh, not only the memory, they have the other domains as well, like executive functions, a language, visual spatial impairment. Uh, usually develop towards the latter part of the disease. They can have uh, common psychiatric problems like depression and anxiety. So it's important to look for these features and, uh, and uh, treat them, uh, the co-associated psychiatric problems. Um, and they can, uh, the Alzheimer's disease is a pathology in the medial temporal lobe. So that can confuse with the uh, frontotemporal dementia, but the most importantly, 
the social and emotional functions are well preserved at the at the beginning of the disease, which would be a helpful thing to differentiate from the frontal temporal dementia. And in the early phase of the Alzheimer's disease, there, there's no any agitation or psychosis being noted, but in the latter stages, these things can 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 develop. Now, uh, you all know, like there are two pathognomonic lesions in the Alzheimer's. You all have heard of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles from your medical school days. Um, and there are important biomarkers which would be helpful uh, to define uh, the syndrome. Uh, uh, in, in the CSF, you can do uh, amyloid beta protein, uh, which usually you expect to uh, lower the amyloid beta proteins and increase tau proteins, the total tau and the phosphorylated tau, which is a marker of neurodegeneration to be increased. So this amyloid beta to uh, phosphorylated tau ratio is something extremely sensitive and sens uh, specific for Alzheimer's disease. And the other uh, biomarkers are the amyloid beta uh, PET scan and the tau PET scan, again, which are not available to most of us uh, for defining these syndromes. But uh, what we get are the imaging facilities that uh, in this uh, scan, what you can see that uh, the, the medial temporal lobes are atrophied and there's compensatory uh, uh, expansion of the lateral horns, uh, the anterior horns of the lateral ventricles. Uh, in this case, uh, the, in the axial scan, the right uh, lateral horn is more enlarged than the left. And in the coronal images uh, across these lateral horns, you can see the lateral horns are enlarged as well as the uh, the me medial uh, uh, temporal lobes are being atrophic. Uh, that is something uh, that we also can see in our patients. When it comes to the diagnosis, uh, you need to plan the treatment. Uh, you have to have a comprehensive care plan in any dementia condition because it's a challenging situation. There are specific uh, treatment for treatment uh, for Alzheimer's disease and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh, like donapazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine uh, are useful at any stage of the Alzheimer's disease. Donapazil and rivastigmine uh, are available for us. Donapazil is available in the oral format. Rivastigmine is available uh, either in oral and skin patches. Uh, uh, NMDI agonist, memantine, uh, is also uh, used as an add-on therapy for Alzheimer's disease, uh, can be uh, used for the moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease uh, therapy. Uh, all you all know that they are not wonderful drugs, but they help to produce the uh, uh, reduce the rate of uh, progression of the disease. In that aspect, they are useful. Um, again, you need to uh, look for the vascular risk factors and the comorbid conditions like psychiatric conditions and anxiety depression and treat them. And uh, sometimes certain drugs can be uh, affect uh, badly for the cognition, something like tricyclic antidepressants, the anticholinergic drugs that you need to withdraw. You have to make uh, the home environment friendly uh, to give a good orientation for the patient. Uh, a large uh, clock, wall clock, a big numbered wall calendars, uh, and marking the day on the calendar by a cross or something like that would be helpful to give a good orientation uh, to the patient. Uh, it's important uh, to counsel uh, and uh, uh, plan the future for the patient uh, along with the family. Sometimes a patient can have legal uh, things with regard to the property, uh, the bank accounts. So somebody uh, uh, related to the patient uh, uh, should be appointed or advised to be appointed as a power of attorney. And uh, handling of responsibilities if, if the patient is sort of a uh, person who is sort of having a responsible job, uh, handing off responsibilities appropriately to someone else uh, should be uh, uh, something important to look at when you're diagnosing a patient with Alzheimer's. Again, the care burden is an important thing, especially towards the latter part of the disease. Uh, you need to address uh, the carer's complaints and try to help them uh, in whatever aspect that you can. Okay. Um, we are going to the case number two, a 57-year-old woman presents with uh, visual difficulties. Uh, she has seen uh, by the optometrist and the ophthalmologist uh, in several locations, uh, and her visual activity is six by nine, uh, which is not a great uh, loss of vision, uh, and has been tried to correct with uh, glasses, but very little success has been noted with her vision. Her husband reports, that she does not see things around her and particularly onto the left side. 
uh, once they were uh, while doing the shopping uh, the husband took a left and then the patient was tra- start continuing to walk straight ahead uh, and then she has uh, she, she lost while during the shopping um, and uh, when you do the mmsc uh, minimal examination she has dem- demonstrated extremely poor in uh, copy drawing uh, of the intersective pentagon as you see in the image and uh, and uh, the other aspects of the memory uh, is not relatively uh, or relatively preserved including the episodic memory the recall memory um, you do a neurological examination and there's uh, somewhat hemianopia uh, left homonymous hemianopia uh, is uh, detected in the confrontation uh, of this patient so this patient presents in significant visual complaints where the eye doctors uh see uh, nothing wrong with their uh, part of uh, uh, the disease condition um, um so the diagnosis in this patient is the posterior cortical atrophy where you get atrophy of the brain in the posterior cortex mainly the occipital uh, and parietal lobes and uh, to a certain extent in the posterior uh, temporal lobes as well so these patients presents with visual spatial and visual perceptual uh, uh, deficit symptoms Uh, what do you mean by visual spatial is uh, in your visual world uh, the spatial arrangement of things like the things uh, located in front the things located back on your right hand left right the perceptual uh, means that uh, the 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 knowledge of the visual knowledge of the the object the color the shape the texture the surface texture that that what kind of knowledge into your uh, the visual uh, knowledge Uh, so they both lose the visual spatial and the perceptual uh, knowledge uh, to a gradient extent uh, and because of these visual uh, and in the perceptual problems these patients if you inquire properly they can have like minor car accidents difficulty uh, challenging uh, parking in uh, small slots um, and uh, they are extremely anxious about riding the escalators uh, they find difficulty judging the speed of the traffic so they are extremely anxious uh, 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 crossing the road or they might have encountered with road traffic accidents they are extremely difficult to sort of find it difficult to enter into a revolving door um, and of course they they may complain uh, that challenges in reading they may describe that the words are jumping here and there because uh, there are visual spatial uh, problems are there uh, troubling them with the reading Uh, they also have abnormalities with the color vision they may describe that the objects are diminishing in colors uh, the fading out of colors um, and uh, 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 when you ask uh, that if you if it is easy to find object in front of them they find it extremely difficult especially if there are more objects in front of them like uh, if you especially the people when they go to cooking and there are a lot of uh, spices in front of them they find it uh challenge it to find the correct uh, uh spice uh container uh, that is called simultaneous yeah there are a lot of things around they find it extremely difficult to locate the uh, uh, correct object and they have difficulty in face recognition as well which is called prosopagnosia yeah. now uh, uh when towards the latter part of the disease when you are getting more and more Uh, parietal lobe and the temporal lobe involvement they can get uh, syndromes like gerstmann syndrome where you get uh, difficulty in calculation difficulty in writing difficulty in ident- recognizing uh, uh, fingers and then the left right disorientation or they can have uh, palent syndrome uh, which is ocular motor ataxia and optic ataxia and simultaneousia or they can have problems with reading which is called alexia or they can have problems with uh, the non dominant parietal lobe which is called apraxia where are difficulty carrying out things uh, uh, like uh, 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 when you ask to sort of uh, comb show how to demonstrate like how to comb the patient they find it difficult to demonstrate although they don't have any motor dysfunction Uh, that their frontal lobe part is preserved with regard to the uh, motor functioning but their parietal lobe make it difficult to perform the task uh, posterior cortical atrophy the pathologically uh, uh, it is shown due to the alzheimer's disease pathology where there is amyloids and the tau proteins um, and in comparison to the typical alzheimer's disease they present relatively at a younger onset less than 65 and they Uh, have relatively preserved episodic memory at least at the beginning at the later on 
uh, disease, when the disease is progressed, they can involve the episodic memory, but the initial part of the disease, they have preserved episodic memory. And uh, in contrast to the frontotemporal dementias, the personality and the behavior aspect is not usually affected. Now, if you do imaging in the Alzheimer's disease, you may see that the posterior cortex is atrophied in these axial cuts. You don't see much atrophy in the posterior cortex in the axial cut, but if you do a um, coronal section uh, of the image, you can see that the posterior parietal uh, and the occipital uh, lobes are really thinned out in the cortex, which is uh, a very nice uh, view when you're appreciating posterior cortical atrophy. And if you have the facilities to do abnormal uh, uh, protein scans, like a tower PET scan, you can see that the posterior parietal and the cortex lobes are having a high uptake in the uh, tower ligand. Now, how we are going to manage the posterior cortical atrophy? Because we initially described that they are due to Alzheimer's pathologic acetylcholinesterase, like uh, donopacil rivastigmine and memantine would be benefit, but not up to the same extent as a memory complaint person would benefit as. And the practical and the psycholo psychological support to the patient and the caregivers are important. Especially, you need to address the safety for the uh, di driving. Um, um, if the patient is having significant visual spatial problems, you have to very politely discourage the driving for the safety of the patient and the others. And then the reading difficulty, if the patients enjoy a lot of reading and now it's difficult because of this uh, condition, audible books would be uh, coming handy. And uh, if the patient is having severe visual problems, then aids for the visually handicapped, like a white cane, or arranging uh, a very simple home environment, uh, do adjustments, uh, would be really, really useful in these patients. Let's go to the case three. Uh, this patient is a 60-year-old retired teacher brought in by the patient's daughter uh, due to uh, sort of annoying behavioral uh, problems with the patient. He has been seen by a psychiatrist and on treatment for depression. Um, this patient on direct questioning, uh, he has been less sympathetic to his wife. Uh, according to the wife, uh, he's, she's extremely frustrated that he, she said that he's less sympathetic even since the marriage. But, uh, but uh, for the last few years, he has become extremely aggressive towards the wife and become abusive, even sort of uh, uh, scolding in abusive language. And... Uh, he has developed a new uh, hobby. He has probably preoccupied with taking care of pets now for the last couple of uh, years. Now, almost uh, more than a, a dozen of cats are at home, and he's, uh, he's repetitively feeding these cats. Almost every two hours early, the patient is feeding the cats, and this has become a real nuisance for the family because the cats are everywhere, and then he used to feed the cats almost every two hours, saying that the cats are hungry. Uh, and uh, when you do a relative, uh, uh, when you do a minimal uh, score, his memory, the visual, spatial, and the language functions are relatively preserved. So it's more almost like no cognitive problems at all. Like, so what's wrong with this man who is present with behavioral problems? So this is a syndrome which we call behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, which is come under the umbrella term of frontotemporal dementia. In frontotemporal dementia, uh, you get uh, uh, dysfunction of the frontal and the temporal lobes. Uh, when you get uh, the behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia, it's mostly the frontal lobe functions which been affected, but uh, 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 there's other uh, uh, category of frontal temporal dementia which is considered as primary progressive aphasia, where uh, you get the semantic dementia, where you get mostly the temporal lobe functions, commonly the left temporal lobe, but well, to a lesser extent, the right temporal lobe also could be affected. And the other aspect which comes under primary progressive aphasia is a progressive non-fluent aphasia, where you get more motor part of the speech being affected and the grammatic speech is being lost. Um, uh, and then the logophenic aphasia, which is a variant of Alzheimer's disease pathology, which is usually due to a, a problem in the temporal and the parietal lobe, so the dominant aspect, the left side, we are not going to discuss the primary progressive aphasia today, but we'll discuss the behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia today. Now, behavioral frontotemporal dementia is the commonest FTD, and it presents uh, with a slowly progressive decline in the social and the emotional functions. Often, these cases are mistaken as for a midlife crisis, a crisis in the middle age, or they may be treated for depression and other psychiatric disorders. 
But a primary psychiatric disorder to happen in the middle age is a little atypical. So you need to consider in those patients, could this be a behavioral frontotemporal dementia? These patients are mostly treated by the psychiatrist because the symptoms are more behavioral and, and then the families usually seek the psychiatric psychiatrist's help rather than a neurologist. Because of their, uh, these behavioral and the social problems, they may have recurrent job losses or marital uh, disharmony uh, or they may have separated from multiple spouses uh, could be seen of these behavioral problems. Uh, to diagnose behavioral uh, variant frontotemporal dementia, you need to have three out of six following criteria positive. And if, it, if they are there, then it will be a possible behavioral frontotemporal dementia. But then your diagnosis could be more strengthened by imaging and the histology if you have the facilities. So what are these six key criteria? They can have early behavioral disinhibition. Where a normal person would inhibit to perform um, certain act because of the accepted social norms, these people are disinhibited. They may uh, behave uh, inappropriately for the strangers, so it will become a real nuisance for the family. They can have apathy, inertia, where they need a lot of encouragement and motivation, even for their day-to-day -day activities like cleanliness. They might need a lot of pushing uh, uh, from behind to have a wash or have clean dresses. Uh, and they can uh, be having uh, demonstrate a loss of sympathy and empathy as we discussed in our case uh, even a trivial uh, even uh, uh, serious conditions of the family member may be diagnosing a cancer of the spouse may be neglected or may be taken care of in order to be care taken care of uh, which is due to that loss of sympathy and empathy they can have uh, preservativeness uh, stereotype behaviors, the compulsive behaviors, the ritualistic behaviors can be demonstrated. So these people can be addicted to various things, maybe addicted to uh, shopping, gambling, or maybe develop uh, new hobbies like a person uh, has acquired, or uh, may be addicted to various kinds of things like phonography because of the behavioral things. They may develop uh, or have hyper orality uh, and not dietary changes. They may develop a sweet tooth uh, towards the latter part of their uh, age, uh, or they can demonstrate executive dysfunctions, uh, where the person may be a sort of brilliantly functioning person. Now they might be even difficult to uh, plan for a holiday, or sort of to plan uh, what is a shopping list kind of thing, or uh, these kind of uh, functions could be affected. Now executive dysfunction can be seen in the latter part of the Alzheimer's disease as well. So how do you differentiate from the typical Alzheimer's disease from an executive dysfunction in the behavioral frontotemporal dementia? These people have relatively preserved motor and visual functions in the FTDs. Now there are about one fifth of cases could be associated genetically and uh, there are commonly occurring genes like mapped granulin and C9OF and then the common pathologies are the tower pathology, TDP43, and the FUS. Of course, we don't have the genetic and the pathological workup uh, uh, in our country, but we have the imaging facilities. If you do imaging, you can see atrophy of the frontal and the temporal lobe, uh, as you see in this scan. Now, the management is extremely challenging because there are no um, disease-modifying therapies like in Alzheimer's disease, and uh, it's a sort of a supporting therapy. Overeating, compulsivity, uh, like problems could be benefited by SSRIs like citalopram, citalopram. The apathy uh, and inertia, these patients would be benefited by SNRI like venlafaxin. The social uh, disinhibition is an extremely embarrassing and challenging situation for the family members and the others. Uh, and you can educate the others and the society about his condition, which is one way of reducing the embarrassment. And if there are a lot of safety concerns like aggressiveness, uh, you might have to consider atypical antipsychotics, especially in the lower doses. Drugs like cutapine and risperidone are helpful. Care burden is an extremely important thing in these patients, and you need to address that as well. We are not going to discuss the primary progressive aphasias because of limited time, but we'll go for the case four. Uh, this is a 70-year-old woman present with, uh, presented uh, hospitalized for a hip fracture and developed a UTI and then the delirium. And the patient was treated successfully and discharged home. And family reports that he, her visual hallucinations uh, are used to sort of continued. Uh, she claims that her children are always at her room, although they are not there. And she was treated with olanzapine for one of his visual 
for her visual hallucinations and then develop prolonged drowsiness. She slept for almost two days after that. So they have to discontinue the treatment. And on examination, patient shows uh, bradykinesia and the family reports symptoms suggestive of uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. So this comprises the syndrome of Levy body dementia. Where you get uh, dementia with fluctuation of cognition. Sometimes the patients look very good at sometimes extremely deteriorated and sometimes comatose as well. And then uh, they can have visual hallucinations and REM sleep behavior disorders because this is a, a synucleinopathy. REM sleep behavior disorders are associated with synucleinopathies and commonly seen those problems. And the pathological hallmark is if you do a autopsy, uh, post uh, uh, autopsy brain studies, you can see the demonstrate the living bodies which are due to the uh, synuclein proteins. Uh, there are a lot of supportive diagnoses, uh, which one of the important thing is that they are extremely sensitive to antipsychotics and they can have autonomic failure and they can have hypersomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness, hyposmia, again a feature of alpha synucleinopathy. They can have other hallucinations, non-visual hallucinations as well and then the delusions. Um, how do you are going to uh, manage the Levy body dementias? Uh, there's uh, only symptomatic management is available. Uh, you should avoid antipsychotics. Her, their cognitive uh, symptoms are benefited by acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitors. Uh, the psychosis, you have to be very careful because uh, typical antipsychotics are extremely sensitive and they become drowsy. Uh, the primovanserine, clozapine, and cotepine are the appropriate treatment for their psychosis. If they have uh, REM sleep behavior disorders, melatonin and clonazepam are useful. Um, I'll try to end my talk here, uh, but the summary is like you need to understand it's a difficult area. You need to do a good history and a cognitive assessment, uh, and that will helpful uh, to differentiate various clinical syndromes. So take home message would be dementia syndromes are complex. A good history and cognitive assessment the key to differentiate the conditions. Supportive, supportive diagnostic tools are helpful like brain imaging, biomarkers and histology, but in the resource poor un, uh, setting, unavailability is a challenge. And management of the patient and the care issues are also important uh, to consider uh, not only the patient. Thank you very much.